Welcome to the Eat Well, Sleep Great, Run Far podcast. My name is Will Franz, and I'm here to help you go farther, faster, and longer without injuries, gut problems, or giving up your favorite foods. This episode was originally recorded as a weekly live training for the 21-day Run Faster Challenge. If you'd like to watch these trainings live or participate or ask questions, please join the Trail and Ultra Running Nutrition Group on Facebook. And if you found this episode helpful or relatable, please subscribe to this show and or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you're listening to it. My whole goal is to get this information to as many trail runners as possible, and every little bit of engagement helps. All right, let's get to the episode. This week, we're going to be talking about hydration and nutrition. So quick concept. Can you get faster overnight? And the answer is kind of maybe. If you've been under fueling, then you can absolutely get faster and improve your speed tomorrow if you start to Im- increase and like properly increase your carbohydrate intake, properly hydrate and fuel yourself well. There was an article a few weeks, months ago, it was called Increasing Carb Intake Before Before and During Races May Improve Endurance Performance. And it was from Trail Runner Mag, and I'll actually pop it in the comments so that anybody can see it. Kim actually posted this in the group a couple months ago with the note, this feels like such a huge dud, this can't be news to anyone, right? Which I kind of love. It means you've been listening in the group and we're all there, like we know carbs perform or at least help you perform faster most of the time. But first off, you might be a little surprised. A few months ago, I posted a picture of a potato on my Facebook wall, and a couple people acted like I was advocating the use of, you know, heroin, um, as if carbs are just bad across the board, which is just not true. And then second, one of the big things in that article, in that Trail Runner article, is how many carbs you can actually intake and still see performance. Some athletes saw an increase in performance and faster recovery when they consumed up to 120 grams per hour of carbohydrate during a mountainous marathon. And that is insane. And before you ask, like, can you even digest that much? I don't know the answer. Um, Everything I've learned tells me no. I've learned that you can digest up to 60 grams of glucose and 90 grams of fructose. And when you combine those together, or sorry, 30 grams of fructose, when you combine those together, you get 90. And I don't know how people are putting back 120. There are definitely mechanisms in your brain that speak directly to your taste buds when they experience carbohydrate. You run faster, it acts like fuel. So maybe that's what's going on, but I have no idea. That said, if you fuel yourself, you can basically get faster overnight. And the longer you're running, the more true this is. When you first started working with that, when I first started working with an athlete named Travis last year, he was eating about 100 grams of carbs per day, mostly from quinoa and potatoes. And he'd go out for six, eight hours in the mountains with very little food. And he said he was just struggling at the three to four hour mark. Nothing terrible. I just he started, like, he just said, I start to feel more in my legs and I'm not having as much fun as I'd like, right? And Travis would definitely be what you might consider fat adapted. He did keto for a bit, and then he kind of settled into mostly paleo for years. He's a great athlete. Um, He's a high school, college football player, backcountry skier, trail runner. He's just generally a great dude with a ton of grit. It wasn't like he wasn't able to perform. He just wasn't really enjoying it that much because he was bonking. So I told him to pop a small bundle of honey in his chest pocket, take a pull off of it, about a teaspoon, like every 15 minutes. Not a lot, just enough. And then the next time we talked, he said almost verbatim, I've spent so much time thinking sugar was bad. Sugar is great. And short answer is yes, it can be. It's all context. If you're a sedentary desk worker who's trying to lose body fat and you don't move really at all, then you might want to cut some of your sugar out. If you're training 10 to 20 hours per week and you want to get faster and you're going through intensity training, then you probably need some, you definitely need a bunch of carbohydrate and it would help if some of that is sugar. Like I know people who used to do nutrition for high level CrossFit athletes, like people who won the games and they would eat 
during the game, say we eat four to 500 grams of carbohydrate per day just through carbohydrate powders. It was total was somewhere in like the six to 700 range. Carbohydrates help if you're doing explosive work. And Travis learned that as soon as he upped his carb intake, he was pushing hard and having a lot more fun for like eight to 10 hours in the mountains and not thinking twice about it. And said like, I don't really want to start with this carbohydrate side of things. It just kind of, it's an easier picture to paint. I would rather start with hydration because most nutrition problems are often hydration problems. Weekly, someone says to me that I'm struggling with my nutrition, even though my hydration is good or on point. And I have one response always, and it's how do you know? How do you know your hydration is good? Have you tested it? And I've never had one person actually tell me yes. If you are struggling with your nutrition and you haven't done a sweat test, then you should do that. It is free. It takes five minutes in addition to training you're already going to do. You should just do it. If you are struggling with your nutrition, do a sweat test. There are two big signs of hydration issues, and then a lot of small ones, but definitely two big ones. One, you struggle to eat in the heat more than you struggle to eat in the cold, and you always have stomach problems around like mile X or time Y. And the reason for that is because dehydration affects your digestion. Dehydration leads to a decrease in your blood plasma. Less blood equals less blood flow. And when you have less blood flow, you get an increased heart rate. And digestion needs a bunch of blood flow to the stomach. When you're running, your body prioritizes more blood to your legs, which means you have less blood in your gut. And you were just not able to digest food. It also raises your cortisol, which slows digestion and increase heart rate also raises cortisol, which slows digestion. So running an ultra is basically like a perfect storm for gut issues, right? Like I've included all this in my hydration guide. And you cannot control everything about race day. You can definitely control your hydration plan. So if you're struggling with hydration and nutrition and you haven't done a sweat test, you should do that if you're able to. Get your sweat test done on like a 60 to 90 minute run. So here's how you do that. Before you leave for a run, pee, and then weigh yourself naked and then run for like 60 to 90 minutes at a comfortable pace. It doesn't need to be super easy. It should not be VO2 max intervals. It should be something you might approach on race day-ish. And then weigh yourself naked right after you get back from the run, subtract any water you drank, and calculate the difference. Then divide by the time you ran. That is your sweat rate per hour. Note the temperature and other relevant factors like humidity, clothing, all that kind of stuff. And you know more or less how much fluid you have to replace per hour to stay hydrated. As a reminder, one pound is 16 fluid ounces, or a pint, and one kilogram is a liter. So if you don't own a scale, we can do different things. I don't either at the moment. I'm going to do it this week at my gym. If you don't want to do that, I bet your neighbor or a friend has one that you could borrow for 24 hours and then give it back. If you do that, you have a really good hourly fluid target. You'll also want to repeat this a few times per year unless you live in a climate that doesn't really change. Your sweat rate will not be the same at 15 degrees Fahrenheit as it is at 100 degrees. If you're, like, if you're lucky, you might get a data point that replicates your race day by doing a few times per year. But even if you don't, you'll like see how your sweat rate changes in different conditions, and you can make a better estimate. My classic example is bad water. The conditions are too extreme to actually do a sweat test for bad water. You don't live in 130 degrees. Yet, if you have sweat tests for like 20, 50, 80, and 100, you can make a better prediction because you've seen whether it increases linearly, or if you have a more of a uh, exponential increase, and how your sweat rate changes. If you cannot do a sweat test, then let's talk about some estimates, right? So some athletes cannot calculate their sweat rate for one reason or another. I've trained a couple people who have like a long, really frustrating history with eating disorders and stepping on a scale just is not a good idea. 
So if something like that applies to you, here's some general hydration advice that applies to ultra runners. When we look at most general recommendations, they just don't apply super well to this sport. And some of that is because as you go through, you are going to end up dehydrated and that's okay. But if you end up dehydrated over the course of a couple hours, like you would for um, a good marathon, that is very different than if you end up dehydrated over the course of 24 hours, as you might for a hundred miler, right? So you want to make sure that your hydration is kind of applying here. A common hydration recommendation that you might see in a lot of things is in at least two of my like nutrition education books on that shelf um, is 600 milliliters of water every hour during activity for any activity longer than two hours. And that is great advice for many people. It is insufficient advice for most ultra runners. The average sweat rate for people is about a liter to a liter and a half per hour. And some people are way outside that range. So if you have a sweat rate of a liter and a half per hour, and you're only exercising for two to three hours, 600 milliliters is probably pretty good. You'll dehydrate, you'll remain within a range for high level performance. You might not even end up like having to pee 12 times through your race, right? All great. But if you are trying to go for like 12, 24, 36 hours, this doesn't apply anymore. Dehydration adds up. So if you were leveraging a small amount of dehydration during a soccer game or a marathon, the same strategy is going to cause big problems during your 100 miler. And if you are unable to get a sweat rate, target like a half a liter to a liter per hour in the winter, and then one to maybe one and a half liters per hour in the summer. Monitor how you feel, look at the color of your pee, adjust as necessary. You're going to be gambling a little more this way, but if that's what you need to do, at least increase off base recommendations. Now let's also talk about absorption, right? You have to absorb the water you take in or else it doesn't do you any good. So you probably can't absorb more than like one to one and a half liters of water per hour. That doesn't always mean don't drink more. Altitude and temperature affect your water intake. So if you're running in extreme heat or at high altitude, you'll likely drink above absorption rates to compensate for the environment. And that's okay. But if you start to feel sloshy, you're probably going too far over. The other thing we need to consider is sodium. In addition to water, you need sodium. Other electrolytes might be helpful, but too much liquid without enough sodium results in hyponatremia, and that can kill you. So we need to make sure we get enough sodium. Most people should get somewhere in the, like, probably 500 to milligrams to one gram of sodium per liter of water. Some people need more than that, like up to double. But if you take away nothing else, please understand that you should always plan sodium in relation to your fluid intake and not per hour. You might be getting plenty of sodium already. You might be low. Um, just make sure you're covered. The reason that we do it per fluid, not per hour, is if conditions change, right? So if you end up running a much hotter day than planned and your sodium was based per hour, but you start drinking a lot more fluid to cool yourself down, you're going to push yourself towards hyponatremia. When I see sodium recommendations per hour, I know <laughs> pretty surely that that nutrition coach does not work or recommend or whoever's making the recommendation. But I see it a lot from nutrition coaches and dietitians where that person probably does not work with ultra runners very often because just don't make that recommendation based on time. You just do it per fluid. That is all you need to do. So do your sodium per fluid intake. Now, how do we get that sodium? There's a lot <laughs> in all of your products, right? So if you use Tailwind, you probably get plenty. They have a really high sodium product. A lot of scratches stuff has a bunch of sodium in it. Now, you can also just add salt to your water if you don't like a ton of it in your food or you target more like lower sodium whole foods. A quarter teaspoon of table salt is about a gram, and that contains about 400 milligrams of sodium. 
So at the bare minimum, you need a slightly heaping quarter teaspoon per liter of water that you intake. And some people might need four times that much. Like that is how much can vary. But start with a quarter to a half teaspoon and see how you end up. That should at least keep you safe. You might be a really salty sweater. If you lose a lot of salt, you'll just need more to stay in balance. The way you figure this out is really hard. Like, get a lab test is the real answer. You can run in a black shirt, and if you end up caked in white at the end of your run, you're on the saltier side. That said, if you're taking in a ton of sodium, you could just be losing all the sodium that you're taking in. So it's a really tough thing to test. You could go run in the heat in a black shirt for an hour and a half without taking in any sodium and see if you end up caked in salt. All of this is probably a little too much. If you're not struggling with cramps or hydration or vomiting and you figured out your like fluid levels and you have an amount of sodium in there that's keeping you safe, great. Um, if not, you could also get a test or you could buy a patch from Gatorade called the GX Sweat Patch or some, something like that. It requires that you download their app and it only works on Apple products. So I've never tried it because I have an Android. If you have an Apple, give it a shot. Uh, it's like 25 bucks for two and you'll probably want to use two because it has a fairly high error rate. So you'll want to at least like run both of them to see how it goes. Some people sweat a lot more than others also. You'll often refer to the, hear this referred to as like super sweaters. Um, somebody I knew when I lived in Tucson, Arizona lost 12 pounds in an hour while exercising in the summer. Granted, it was 100 10 degrees, but still. And if you're a super sweater, you'll likely experience dehydration. You might be able to reduce the deficit, but you're going to struggle to actually hydrate enough. It's not really going to be possible. You cannot absorb six liters of fluid an hour. It's not possible. So you need to try and do your best to cover. One thing you could do is try prehydrating. There are Products like Scratch Labs, Hyperhydration Mix, um, Element is also really high in sodium. You also just put a shitload more sodium in your uh, water. I have no affiliation with any company, but both of those definitely make good products that can help you with a heavy sweat rate. And if you have high blood pressure, kidney issues, uh, heart disease, any of these things, or your doctor told that you have to limit your sodium or salt, then don't take those products, right? Like that just should be common sense. And if you want to know more, shoot me a message. I'm happy to help you out. Now, other electrolytes. There's a lot of debate about whether or not other electrolytes actually do you any good. Um, some people swear by them. Some people think they do nothing. There was a study done a few years ago, like it might actually be a decade at this point, that tested whether magnesium seemed to make any effect on cramping. Now, the problem with that study is from what I could tell, they didn't tell you what kind of magnesium it is. So if it was magnesium citrate, it might just not have been absorbed. If it were, you know, um, a much more absorbable form of magnesium, it could have been a valid study. I have no idea. But magnesium didn't seem to improve cramping. What does seem to help, in my experience, is potassium. It is required for muscle firing. And if you don't have any potassium in you, it doesn't tend to do very well for your performance. And most of us live a lifestyle and eat a diet that is underfed on potassium because we just don't get enough of it in our day-to-day -day diet. So increasing your potassium or finding a supplement that can help you out with that could be really useful. Otherwise, I don't see a whole lot of benefit to these big electrolyte blends that most companies seem to put in. All of this is great on our race day, but if you don't stay hydrated daily, you are also going to struggle. You must start your race hydrated. If you start dehydrated, then you're just trying to dig yourself out of a hole. A great way to keep an eye on daily hydration is what's called your what status, W-U-T. It stands for weight. So if your total body weight shifts more than like 2% from one day to the next, it is a good sign of a significant hydration shift, right? Your you shouldn't, probably 1% is even more accurate, but we'll see this fluctuation pretty standardly of like 1% to 2% per day. And if we end up with even more than that, it's almost certainly hydration. 
you are not losing pounds of fat per day. I don't care how many calories you're cutting or putting it on that fast either. It just Your body doesn't work very well that way. So if you're having big shifts in your uh, weight, then that is, means your hydration is not consistent. Urine. If your urine is darker than a light yellow, you might be dehydrated. This is particularly relevant for first morning urination. We've all like heard the color concept. This is mostly applied to first thing in the morning. It can happen later in the day, but if you drink, say you drink a gallon of water, it is going to flush through you, because again, you're not gonna absorb all of it, and your pee will be a very, very clear color. That doesn't mean you're super hydrated. It means you drank a gallon of water in a short period of time. So first morning urination, if it is a light yellow, it means you're probably pretty consistently hydrated. And then thirst. If you are not thirsty, you might be fine. If you feel thirsty, you're probably dehydrated. And if not, you should probably drink anyway because you're thirsty. When you wake up, check your weight if you want, can, whatever. Um, check your urine color, ideally the stream, not the bowl. Yes, I realize there are anatomy differences that make this stuff, and then thirst. And if one thing seems off, something might be askew. If all three are off, you're probably dehydrated. And if you want your hydration levels to be, you want your hydration levels to be stable, more or less, in your daily life and through training for a couple primary reasons. It's healthy and it leads to better performance. And then sudden changes in fluid intake can really alter your hormones and increase your dehydration risk on race day. For example, if you greatly increase your water consumption for like a week and then you mess up on Friday, drink very little, and your race is on Saturday, you'll be extremely dehydrated on your race day. This is how fighters cut five to 10 pounds the day before their weigh-in. They push fluid for a week, and then they cut fluid, and then they pee out all that extra water, and end up very dehydrated for their weigh-in. They have 24 hours, typically, between their weigh-in and their fight. You are just going to end up racing dehydrated. So keep stable hydration levels. Ideally, good hydration levels. If you want a good general recommendation for daily fluid intake as an athlete, take your body weight in pounds, divide it by two, and add 15, and that's more or less how many ounces of fluid, of fluid you should be drinking per day. Not water, fluid. You can drink more. I tend to need more than that to stay hydrated, especially in a Utah summer, but like I weigh 170, 180, so divide that by two, it's like 85, 90, add 15, 105. I need more than that to actually stay hydrated. You should know how much you need. And coffee counts, soda counts, all these things count. Yes, caffeine is technically dehydrating, it is technically a diuretic. The fact that coffee is like 99% water makes up for that. If you drink nothing but coffee in the morning and then drink nothing for the next 12 hours, yes, you'll be dehydrated, but you'd be dehydrated anyway. So it counts as your fluid intake. And then one more note before we move on to the nutrition aspect of this is occasionally I will see someone talk about dry fasting or like trying to train dehydration or getting used to running dehydrated and just don't do this. It's stupid. Every year someone dies running in the heat and it's always sad and it's almost always preventable and your body, your body does not create physical adaptations to dehydration you don't get better at dealing with it. You can get mentally better at suffering through it. Do something else to build mental toughness. Dry fasting or training your dehydration is just dumb. Don't do it. Once your hydration is on point, once you're able to digest food, then we can figure out what your food intake should be. And you don't, you want to target some amount of total calories per race or calories per hour or calories per section or, or something, right? Like we need, we need a target. You don't need a perfect assessment of your caloric expenditure. You can't be very accurate. You, unless you go live in a metabolic chamber, you're not going to get a very good estimate. Holly, training for dehydration is a thing. Well, it's not, but people try to, and then they get hurt. So yeah, please don't do that. Um, so you don't need a perfect assessment of this. Um, all of your packaged food is allowed to be off. Everything is allowed to be 
off a little bit. Your Garmin has no idea how many calories you burn. Like we just need, we just need an idea, right? Something to aim for. If we're gonna shoot this basic target, you will burn about one calorie per kilogram of body weight per kilometer that you travel. Your speed is irrelevant, just go by time. So if you weigh 80 kilograms and you are traveling 100 uh, kilometers, you'll burn 8,000 calories if it's all flat. And then if we take vertical into account, we can say that one kilometer of vert is equal to about 10 kilometers on flat land. So if you're going straight up. And then we just add all that together. So let's look at this as an example about how I would and am making a caloric plan for myself for the Dead Horse 50. So Dead Horse is 50 miles long. It's gonna have uh, 4,000 feet of elevation gain. And um, I weigh, we give or take, 75 kilograms for easy math. All right, so weight, 75 kilograms, distance, 80 kilometers, because 50 miles is 80 kilometers, and then elevation gain, 4,000 feet, is about one and a quarter kilometers. I'm going to burn, so weight, 75 times distance, 80, is about 6,000 calories on flat, and then weight, 75 times vert distance of 1.2 times 10, because every vertical kilometer is worth 10 on flat ground, ends up being about 900. So I'm burning about 6,900 calories in this race. Now, I don't need to eat that many. That's how many I'm gonna burn. We wanna to try to replenish about 30 to 40% of your overall with carbohydrates. A good amount of, because a good amount of your energy burn comes from stored fat. A little bit of it comes from protein and you just don't need to excessively tax the gut. You don't need to pack more in. Granted, they said 120 carbs per hour helps, but that was really during a speed effort. If you're going for these long efforts, like 50, 100, 200 miles, you don't need to replenish that much. You're just going too slow. So my target for this race would be somewhere between about 2,000 and 2,750 calories. And that's what I'm going to target. So if once I get close to my race, I should have some time goals that I will figure out. I'll divide that num those numbers by, let's call it 12, and figure out how many calories I need per hour. And then once I know how many calories per hour, I divide that by four, and I know how many carbs I need per hour. Easy peasy. So anything up to 60 grams is typically pretty easy. Over that is still achievable. You just need to combine your sources a little bit. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking for. If you want to be more exact, you could further break it down by sections. So if you want to look at whatever your race profile is and you know there's a big hill in this one spot, you could target that section. You might, what I'm going to do and what most people should probably do is target between their aid stations because right? that's when you get to refill. So how many calories more or less do you need during this aid station based on how long it's going to take you, etc. And what can you replenish with? Now some like final thoughts before we move on to the, the question concept. So that is how you hydrate. Clearly a much longer section on that because it's more important and there's a lot more to it and you can screw it up more. And then once you know your hydration, just do a little bit of math and figure out your carbs. And it doesn't mean you can't ingest fat or protein or whatever else you want. You just don't need to. It can be super helpful because if you're doing... Unless you're Carl Meltzer, you probably don't want to run an entire 100 miler on goo. I do really well on that kind of stuff, and I still don't want to do that. But you could, because <laughs> that's mostly what you need to replenish. Your body has a ton of fat stores. You need to, re you need to replace your carbohydrate. A couple more thoughts. Most of your intake should be small and consistent doses. I really like to view hydration and nutrition like you're trying to replicate an IV. And I just heard this from someone else recently, and I've been pushing this for a year, so like great minds think alike. Um, but you wanna use the IV strategy. You don't want to, say you need to consume 250 calories per hour and about a liter of fluid. Every hour, you don't wanna down a liter like you're chugging it and then consume 250 in one gulp. You'd be much better 
to do small doses every like 10 to 15 minutes. And you need, I would not go longer. I would definitely not go longer than a half an hour. For most people, I would not go longer than 20. You need to find what's a balance for you based on whether you need to stop or it's difficult for you to eat on the run or how long, how much it breaks your flow. All of those things matter, but you still need to set up reminders every so often to make sure you're like metting it out. I really like the timer idea. For a while, people, they still are pushing like a drink to thirst or eat to hunger idea, which works fine on shorter races. It's not what you want to do if you're like trying to win, but it, it does fine. Um, and it will actually keep you pretty safe. So the way this came out was Tim Noakes fighting against um, all of the hyponatremia that was happening in marathons because people were just drinking like a cup of water at every, every mile or an aid station and they just ended up like hurting themselves. So the drink to thirst push came, but this doesn't apply to, again, ultra runners. It doesn't actually apply if you want to perform at a high level. So you want to set a timer and like figure out what you need and try to even it out. And a note on th salt, again, it can be really difficult to figure out how much salt you need unless you get a test of some sort. So a very quick thing is, does it taste bad? If salt tastes pretty good, then, or at least neutral, then you're fine to keep taking it in. As soon as salt starts to taste bad, stop taking it in. Your taste buds do a really good job of communicating to your brain and kidneys. And as soon as salt starts to taste disgusting, ditch it. My last note is, this is not all that complicated, but most people just don't want to do it because it's like five minutes of tedious work. Your training <laughs> to run really far, um, you're functionally training like a high-level athlete. Most semi-professional athletes in other sports put in the like 10 plus hours that a lot of ultra runners do or even recreational triathletes, right? Like you train a lot. You're training like a high level athlete, act like it. Figure out what your hydration and nutrition is because it will keep you safe and help you perform better. It's pretty much what I have for today. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them, pop them in the chat. You can come on and ask them live, whatever you want to do. That is our hydration and nutrition training. Cool. There we go. Questions are coming in. Melissa, how do you feel about Tailwind? I have no affiliation or like preference for any product over another. I also have a pretty rock solid gut. I can't digest a lot when I'm exercising, but otherwise I don't care. Um, Tailwind is made from dextrose and a lot of people cannot digest it very well. It will cause some people to like fart a lot. It will cause people to poop their pants. Um, other people, like I think David Goggins notoriously uses it for all of his races and pretty much nothing else, right? Like it is, it seems to be either a love it or hate it thing. If you don't digest it well, you're probably never going to digest it well because it means your stomach just doesn't handle dextrose very well. If you do digest it well, it probably means you're pretty good to go. I have some athletes who use nothing, like really nothing else other than it, and then I have some people who cannot use it at all. So if you can, that's great because it comes with a bunch of sodium, actually a pretty good electrolyte panel, and it's really cheap compared to some of these other things. But if you can't digest it, it's going to ruin you. Esther, I saw that Liquid IV claims that one of their drinks equals like 10x or something. Is that for real? I don't understand what that question means. Um, if you can clarify, I'm happy to answer it. 10x what, I guess, is the part of that I don't understand. Holly, what's a good source of sodium to carry with you? I don't care. Um, sodium, sodium, sodium. So... You can get it from potato chips. You can salt like uh, you can salt a potato and have some mashed potato in a bag, or like potato cubes. Sodium comes in Tailwind. Like you could, I put real Redmond's real salt in a water bottle and consume it like that, and that's what I use for sodium. But it really doesn't matter. Yeah, I don't know. It's very possible, Esther, that they were saying that one packet of their thing 
hydrates you 10 times as well as just water? I honestly have no idea. Um, I will say that's ludicrous. Um, but if you lose a liter of water and you try to replace it with nothing but water, you will need to consume like 150% of what you lost. So you need to consume a liter and a half. Whereas if you have a sufficient amount of salt and some carbohydrate, it's much more one-to-one. -one. And this is actually a lot of what sodium and carbohydrate do for shorter sports. For ultras, you actually need to replenish or else you're gonna hit the wall, you're gonna bonk, you're gonna uh, end up with hyponatremia. Like you need to refill your sodium and glycogen stores. But if you're doing stuff for, Gatorade was invented for football, right? Like in the heat of Florida, and most football players are not that long. Um, the reason that it helps so much is because it helps you hydrate better. So if something like Liquid IV, which has a really high salt content, it's actually a great hydration product. I, I recommend it. I think it's fantastic if you like it. Um, but it, it 10 times is insane, if that's what they're saying. I have no idea what that means. One and a half easily, twice. I don't know what the math works out that to be, but 10 is crazy. One last thing before we get moving. Um, I want to give away one prize for the week, and this prize comes to someone I chatted with for a while this week. It's going to go to Melissa Hazel, and it's going to be a hydration package. Um, as I said, everyone's going to have a say in what they win for their prize, whoever wins. She's been really communicative in the group. She's participated a lot, and she's putting in a bunch of work this coming week to get her nutrition up. So she deserves it, and she is going to get a nutrition package that's going to be worth about like 25 bucks to help her fuel a little better. So congrats, Melissa. You and I will chat later to figure out exactly what you want, because again, if I bought someone Tailwind and they're just going to turn into a fart machine, that seems silly. So you and I will nail down exactly what you want. All right, everyone. I am, if there's no more questions, we're going to head out here. Really appreciate y'all sticking around. Thank you so much. And I will have a replay up of this pretty shortly. I right now need sleep, but I do have a bunch of time tomorrow, so I'm hoping to get it done tomorrow. And I will see y'all in the group. Please get your sweat tests and stuff done this week and let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to help. That's what I'm here for. We all have a great week. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the show. To be clear, I'm not a doctor nor a registered dietitian and nothing you heard was medical advice. You should always speak with a qualified medical professional before making any changes to your training regimen. If you enjoy the podcast or found it useful, please take a couple seconds to give it a rating or share it with a friend. Every little bit helps. And if you want more of this information, please head to the Trail and Ultra Running Nutrition Group on Facebook. You'll be in good company with other like-minded people who like to do hard stuff outside.